So ladies, and, and this is also applicable to, to the gentlemen that are here with us. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the secrets of a confident woman, but it applies to people all over, across the board. So I have a question to start off with, ladies. I want to ask you, can we as ladies have a strong faith if we have no or little confidence? Let me ask you the question again. Can we as ladies have a strong faith if we have no or little confidence? You see, ladies' faith is confidence. When we put our trust in God and into His Word and into His very character, we live lives that take on a new stability, a focus, and a poise. A biblical self-confidence is a real confidence in God's word and in who he is. We put no confidence in the flesh, nothing at all. But we have every confidence in the God who has made us, the God who has called us, the God who has saved us, and the God who keeps us. So I'd like to start by sharing the very first secret of a confident woman. The very first secret of a confident woman is that she needs to know that she is loved. You see, all people find it very important to have that sense of love. And that's not being loved for the positions we hold, for the clothes we wear, for what we look like, for the status that we have, for the areas that we live in. It's to be loved for who we are. We all have that innate desire. People want that unconditional love, warts and all. And boy, do we have some warts. I know that this is definitely true of my life. I have constantly seeked love from a very, very young age. And God already knew my whole life story, I just didn't know it back then. But I sensed his presence on my life from the age of about nine. You see, I wasn't raised in a church-going family at all. I was raised in an amazing family, don't get me wrong. I love my brothers, three awesome brothers, and my parents. But we weren't a church-going family at all. I'm third in line, so I've got two brothers that are older than me and one that is younger than me. But I also knew at a very young age that I was quite different to my peer group. I just didn't slot in. I wasn't one of these kids that just went, hey, I'm just going to be cruisy and easygoing. That just didn't fit who I was. And with that came a lot of challenges. Now, I don't know about any of you ladies, no matter how old you are, but I can share that even at a young age, because I was different, I was bullied. I was bullied at school in an horrific way. The things that people said to me, the pain that comes with being bullied is not easy to face. But I will say that it does make us stronger You see, bullying unsettles us. It's like taking that rug from right underneath us and pulling it out. And we don't know who we are. We feel so alone in that particular space. And then at the age of 14, as I shared, I've got a wonderful family. But very surprising to us as children, we never ever saw our parents fight or argue. There were no disagreements. But when I was 14, my parents then announced that they would get divorced. And unfortunately, what that did was it put a, a distance between me and particularly my father. Because as children, we all lived with my mother. And as a young girl, not having that connection with a father, straight away that gave me a sense of feeling unloved and unworthy. The final straw was when I got married, and that marriage ended in infidelity. 
So the very thing that I dreaded from coming from a divorced family, I land up myself getting divorced. I can only share with you, and I'm sure that there are ladies here that can agree that you know what that pain is like going through a broken marriage. None of us get married with the idea of having that marriage broken. So that pain, that alone time that comes within that, that sense that only you are going through what you're going through. It can be really, really challenging. And ladies, that's when we need one another, right? That's when we need to be able to connect with one another and remind us that we do have a God who loves us, a God who loves us unconditionally, warts and all. We need to remind ourselves that we have a God who has promised that he will not forsake us. He will be with us every step of the journey that we take. And so today I'd like to encourage each and every one of you, no matter where you come from, no matter where you've been, no matter what your life has looked like in the past, let's keep our eyes focused on the prize. Let's look ahead. And let's do that together as ladies journeying alongside one another. The second step of a confident woman is that she actually understands the importance of alone time. Now, my daughter is actually here with me, and she's upstairs, and she'll have a smile on her face as I talk to this one, because she hasn't heard my talk. She always tells me how so busy I am, and I am. There's no denying it, right? Because I'm so passionate for God and for ministry that I'm busy. But alone time is crucial. It is vitally important for us, for us to grow. If we don't have that alone time, we're not going to have that relationship with God. You see, ladies, as a confident woman, we have to value that alone time, time to contemplate life, time to think, time to process what has taken place in our lives, time for healing, time to spend with God. You see, we don't need to be on our mobile phones 24-7, right? We also don't have to fill every minute of our day with other people, with Facebook feeds, or with too much television. Because unfortunately, technology has actually taken over our lives. We need to be able to take that technology and set it aside and say, now this is my time, and that's okay. So as I started sharing right at the beginning, my daughter will have a smile on her face because this is definitely a place where there's room for improvement in my life. I need to be able to have those boundaries. You see, I love people so much that at times I battle to say no. But God has put it on my heart, and so that's why I can share it with you today, because I am working on it. The third secret of a confident woman is that a confident woman refuses to live in fear. As Esme shared with us, we live in a toxic world. And there's nothing that we can do about that right now. We can't change the world for what it is. But as women, we are emotional, and it becomes so easy for us to live life according to how we feel. If we feel good, do it, right? No, wrong. It's got nothing to do with how we feel. It's got to do with what we know. And what we know comes from the Holy Bible. All the facts for how to live life is based in the Bible. And so that is how we are to live our lives. 
You see, when we live life based on our feelings, we actually walk straight into Satan's trap because that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to base everything on how we feel. If we feel good, hey, don't worry about it. Don't question anything. Don't go and check it up in your Bible, right? Just do it. That is what society today is encouraging us to do. And it is the most wrong thing that we can do. You see, Satan wants us to make decisions based on what the world is telling us to do, not according to our spiritual life our according, or according to our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. To live our lives, we need to be able to push back We need to be able to make a stand. We need to be able to know who we are in Christ and not live according to any of our fears. You see, when we've been through traumas and tragedies, when we've been through even more significant events, whether we've been through abuse, whether we've been through rape, no matter what it is that we have been through, I can share that God wants us to be able to heal and get over those things. He wants us to overcome the fears that we have in our lives. You see, quite often we are too scared to stand up. We are too scared to actually make a stand and to actually be who we are in Christ. God wants us to be assertive. He doesn't want us to be passive. He doesn't want everybody to just walk all over us. Because if we are weak and we are not healed, we cannot minister for God. We cannot be that vessel. We have to have that internal healing, that energy, so that we can actually move forward as ladies in ministry. Lady. Fear does not come from God. It comes from the enemy of our souls. And if we know that, then we truly understand that fear isn't just about being scared or doubting or questioning our faith. It's much deeper than that, right? It affects every decision we make in our lives. It affects who we hang out with. It affects what we do when we're at home. It affects what we do socially. It affects how we do it socially. Because as vessels in Christ, people are constantly looking at us and watching us. And we have to be able to set that example. This weekend, our our conference is referred to as the Renew Conference. But our theme is actually to be the change you want to see. You see, if it doesn't start with us, ladies, it's not going to happen. It has to start with us as individual people. Every day we are fighting a spiritual war, and so we have to make good, wholesome choices. So ladies, I'd like to encourage you, let us choose life, let us choose faith, Let us choose God. The fourth secret of a confident woman is that a confident woman recovers from setbacks. Now, ladies, I can tell you, if this were not the case, I wouldn't be standing here right now. In this life, you and I are inevitably going to go through significant challenges and experiences and setbacks. And for some of us, those setbacks are a lot deeper than being bullied, a lot deeper than abuse, a lot deeper than rape. For some of us as parents, the very nightmare that can come our way is one worse than that. And I will share that with you shortly. 
I will tell you, though, it's only when we stop trying to recover that we are actually seen as failures. Up until then, there is no such thing as failure, right? It's only when we actually stop and we give up that we have actually failed. So again, I want to encourage you ladies, no matter what it is that you've been through, no, what, no matter what it is that you are currently going through, don't give up. Don't give up on yourself, but more importantly, don't give up on a God that loves you unconditionally. You see, the truth is many people get confused when they're trying to figure out what they are actually supposed to do with their lives. We question that, right? It's a bit of a journey. What is it that we're meant to be doing? Where are we meant to be? What is ministry meant to be for us? Sometimes we can only see the sadness, the tragedy, and the traumas that have come our way, and that's where our focus is. But you know what? It's taken me nearly all of my life to eventually realize where God wants me. And going through what I've been through, I've questioned at a time, saying, well, God, where do you want me? What am I meant to be doing? When he called me into ministry, I could only smile and think, he's got such an awesome sense of humor, right? Did he wait for me? Did he need to wait for me to be the age I'm at to call me? Why not when I was younger? But then he taught me that right now I can share so much more with you ladies than what I could 20 years ago. I can share life experience. I can share the trials that I've been through. And that is why God has only called me now. You see, when I was about 35 years old, I was enrolled into a program at the Methodist Church. As I shared earlier, when I was younger, I sensed God's hand on my life. And so I had to ask my parents to go to church. And they would take me to church when nothing else was happening. And that was Sunday church. It was the Methodist church. And so I attended the Methodist church for, for most of my life. And when I was at 35, I decided I wanted to study the Bible from cover to cover. And it was during that time that I established that the Sabbath was actually a Saturday. And I spoke to my pastor, I went to him and I said to him, look, from what I'm studying, it's clear that the Sabbath is a Saturday. What's your thoughts? And he said, yeah, that's how it started off, but yet we've changed it. Well, that was enough. That's all that I needed to hear. It was since this time that I was seeking a Sabbath-keeping church, and this was the start of my journey into ministry. Lady, the fifth, the fifth secret of, of a confident woman is that a confident woman does not live in if-only and what-if moments. And I take a deep pause when I even say that. See, one of the worst things that we can do is to actually focus on what we have lost, what we have failed in what we have experienced, what we have felt. And so often we say, but what if? What if I had more money? What if I didn't have a child? What if I lived in a different place? What if I was married to a different man? There can be so many what ifs. If only I had more education, more money, more opportunity. Now, I know myself, one of the things growing up, and you might think it's quite crazy, right? But as I shared earlier, I've got three amazing brothers, all tall, robust, good-looking men. And then here I come along, right? And one of the things that I always thought is, I want to have bigger calves, right? God didn't give me, gift me with calves. So I went to the gym and boy, did I work out. Now, anyone that has the same problem, let me tell you, give it up. If you do not have calves, you are not going to get calves unless you're going to have an implant. And I definitely don't recommend that. All right. So definitely not one of those things that you can change. 
you learn very quickly just to love yourself the way God has made us. Ladies, there are also some ladies who have been through really significant if-onlys and what-if moments in their lives. But the Bible tells us that God will not give us more than what we can bear. And I will tell you, it took me a long time to be able to speak that out because I really struggled with that. I struggled saying to God, well, I'm not superwoman. I don't think I can actually bear this. I don't think I can take on more than what I've already taken. So let me continue my story with you. In arriving in Australia in 2008, my family joined me. It was my husband. I'll put him first this time. <laughs> my beautiful daughter that's upstairs. I've got two stepdaughters, but only one of them came with us. And she's married and she's living in Hamilton. And also my son. So there were five of us that came to Australia. Now, anyone that, that has emigrated will understand the challenges that come with that, right? We'd never been to Australia. It was the first time we were coming. We'd made a family decision. We never knew anyone in Australia. Never knew anything. Dr. Google was the one that helped us to choose where we were going to live. <laughs> but other than that, it was, it was a completely new experience. I'd managed to obtain and secure a job from South Africa. I worked as a life scientist in clinical research, and I'd been in the industry for, at that stage, must have been about 15 years. And so I managed to obtain a job, but there was a prerequisite. We had to all come into Australia, and then within two weeks, I had to fly out to Singapore to do a course for one week and at the end of that week, I wrote an eight-hour exam, and if I didn't get 80% or more, my family and I would go back to South Africa. So no pressure, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, we're still here, so, so obviously God helped me through that process. But there were a lot of ups and downs along the way, a lot of challenges coming to a country that everyone in South Africa had said, hey, Australia's just like South Africa. <sighs> yes, <laughs> let me leave it like that, right? When you've lived in a different country, there's so many different cultural differences, so many different nuances. I mean, Australia is beautiful. I'm not denying that, but it's different. And so there were a lot of challenges for us. I mean, starting from sleeping on blow-up mattresses, and you pray you don't get a puncture on the floor, and waiting for the furniture to arrive, uh, no car, so walking everywhere. We were fit, I will tell you, super fit. And when we arrived here, we didn't have a spiritual home. So the first spiritual home we actually went to uh, was a Presbyterian church. You see, although I had established the Sabbath in South Africa, I couldn't find a, a church in South Africa that I felt comfortable about calling it home. And so that only took place when we came to Australia. So shortly after going to the Presbyterian church, um, I kept on searching for that Sabbath-keeping church and found one in Mont Albert and went in and said, all right, tell me a bit about your church. And then I thought he was the pastor, but he was actually the elder, and he shared a bit about the church, and I went, yes, this is our church. We just felt so comfortable. It was an amazing time in our lives, but we still had challenges and struggles. And let me tell you, ladies, the biggest fear and tragedy that any parent can have is to lose a child. My son <clears throat> passed away in December 2012. And that pain is horrendous. The other pain 
is to watch your daughter. Grieve the loss of her brother. It is mind-numbing. It is soul-wrenching. And it challenges your faith like nothing else. Now you will understand why I say I battle with the Bible verse that God says that he will not give us more than what we can deal with. Let me continue to the sixth secret of a confident woman. A confident woman takes action and never gives up. Lady, it's easy to give up. It's easy to just say this is too hard, especially because we are emotional beings. That is the easy way out. But I want to encourage you never to give up and never to give up on God because he will never let you down. Yes, we might not understand things. I sit here today, I don't have all the answers. But I can tell you that it is now, it's coming up to the sixth anniversary of my son's passing. But I can tell you when I look back in my life, it has been amazing as to how God has worked in that space. As I shared with you, none of my family believed in God. I can tell you right now, my parents are divorced, but my father is a Seventh-day Adventist. I can tell you that my mother, she goes to church on Sunday because the closest church to her is a Sunday-keeping church, right? But she believes in the Sabbath. She does not go to the shops or anywhere else on the Sabbath. I can tell you that my daughter, who was angry with God for taking her brother, has a better relationship now with God than she ever did before. I can also share that after my husband and I were baptized together, my mother got baptized in her own swimming pool at home. <laughs> but let me also tell you, my eldest brother, who came here for my son's funeral to represent the family, he has never believed in God. If anything, he was actually more against God than for God. And just on the 2nd of July, just July that's just, just gone past, the 2nd of July that's just passed, it was his birthday. And I remember having a conversation with him about six months ago, and he just said, I'm angry, I can't see God working in my life, because um, I'd had an open discussion with him about God, and he said, what God, there is no God, I can't see him working in my life, etc. And I just said to him, I just have one request. And that request is, please don't give up on God. Not now. Don't give up on him. I said, I'm going to be praying for you. So please don't give up. Anyway, on the 2nd of July, when I phoned him to wish him for his birthday, at the end of the conversation, now I must tell you, right, my, my eldest brother is six foot four. He's broad. He's a strappy man. He's a bloke bloke, right? He's not, there's nothing soft and meek about him at all. And we were just about to put down the phone and he said, listen, I've got to tell you something. And I just heard silence on the other side of the phone because he was trying to gather the words. He was getting quite emotional. And he said to me, remember you said you were going to pray for me? And I said, yes. And he said, Something changed. He said, since then, things have been changing in my life. You see, unfortunately, he was married. And I say unfortunately only because 
due to lots of problems on both sides, both his and his wife's at the time, they landed up getting divorced. But during that time of divorce, she took away everything that he owned. She used bribery. She went to the police. She used money. She did everything. At the time, he owned a house for himself, a house for his wife, a house for his son, a house for his daughter, and a vacation home. He had worked hard for the money that he had earned. And she took it all away from him, that he was living with my mother. So the pain that he was feeling was real. And on that day when he said to me, something has changed, he said to me, you know what, I've had to start all over, but I can see that God is working in my life. He did turn around and say, you know what, people suck. <laughs> and I just had a smile, right? <laughs> because he hadn't had very good experiences with people. And so he said that, and I just said to him, you know what, a lot of people come into our churches wanting to find love, wanting to have a sense of belonging, and when they don't, they actually get angry with God. And I said to him, praise God that you have learned the exact opposite. You've learned that people suck, right? But God is good. I said, and that is an amazing lesson that some of us still have to learn. So I will tell you that everything that I've been through, as hard as what it has been, I can see clearly how God has worked through that. And there's only one person to glorify in all of this, right? And this is God. He is an amazing God. He is a God who loves you. He is a God who cares for you. He is a God that wants what's very best for you. The last secret that I'd like to end on is sharing that a confident woman of the 21st century knows that a relationship with Jesus Christ is what makes the difference. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are missing out. You are missing out on something significant. You see, today, life has changed a lot. And people call it all sorts of things, you know, postmodernism, um, and, and, and the, they talk about the millennials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's actually existed for quite a while. So I want to challenge your thinking just for a brief moment. If I told you that a tree fell in the woods and no one was there to hear it, would it make a sound? Now you're going to go, oh, duh, of course, you know. But let me tell you, teachers have asked this question, almost prompting that the answer is no, because it's the way that things have changed so significantly. Let me give you another example. Years ago, when we heard the news on the television, it was based on straightforward fact. It would be this happened, and this was the result. They don't do that anymore. They now do all the table talks, right? So let's get in and let's debate things. And so you get two different perspectives on what happened, but they won't actually tell you which one's right and which one's wrong. And so it's giving us the power to make that decision. And if we make the wrong decision, we are in significant trouble. You see, life has become a lot more liquid, a lot more fluid, so to say, where people have choices, and people can decide exactly what it is that they want to do with their lives. You see, only Christianity has a gospel or good news that is already complete. Interestingly enough, the five biggest religions that are non-Christian, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Judaism, all have a gospel that believe that you have to do something to be saved. I mean, come on, people. What an amazing God we have, right? If it was up to me, I would be lost because I can do nothing on my own without my Lord and Savior. It is only Him that I glorify. And no other religion gives us that. Ladies, in my life, I would be nothing without Jesus. 
I can only stand here before you and share the way I'm sharing because of him, because he has given me the strength, he has given me the confidence to be able to be that vessel for him to work through. And none of that glory comes to me. I am purely the vessel. So can we as ladies have a strong faith if we have no or little confidence? Ladies, this is not possible because faith is confidence. A confident woman knows that she's loved. She refuses to live in fear. She recovers from setbacks. She does not live by if only and what ifs. She is a woman of action, and she impresses God, not people. Ladies, walk in confidence, knowing that through God, you have all that it takes to be the confident, beautiful woman that you are. Thank you. Thank you.